It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to uh, Jennifer Jacobs' talk, uh, Codable Objects, Making New Fashion. I had the pleasure of meeting Jennifer about a year ago when I first started here at the museum. I sent, was sent to a conference in Boston, and it's called the Digital Media Learning Conference. And I saw Jennifer with her research group, and she was demoing some of the software that she's been playing with us and our visitors. Um, in the crafting fashion space over in object stories. Um, I was so in infatuated with the idea of um, mashing up uh, fashion and art and science that I told Jennifer, I said, I'm bringing you to here to Portland. Um, <laughs> and uh, I made a deal with Stephanie Parrish, who is the public programs director here. And, and, and luckily, uh, Jennifer's here with us. So I'm very excited about this. Um, so. As I said, I've spent the past two days with Jennifer. Um, she's been helping visitors create designs with her software program called Dress Code and also a CNC embroidery machine. If you want to see some of those designs, please check out our Facebook page and also our Twitter. And if you're not a social media person, um, <laughs> you can uh, just um, go to Jennifer's website. And I'm sure she'll talk to you about that a little bit later as well. So uh, Jennifer is a researcher at the MIT's Media Lab and the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. And um, I, I just wanted to, to once again thank her for being here. And before I turn over the mic to her, I have a couple of other announcements that I have to make. So um, Jennifer is also part of the Object Stories exhibition that we have going on right now. Uh, the Object Stories exhibition is um, intertwined with this whole idea of the fashion programming that's happening out of Italian style since 1945. And the Object Stories exhibition is something that is also unique in the fact that it's taking um, fashion design, a local fashion designer, uh, students, and also uh, makers within the community uh, who are having a dialogue about wearable technology. Some of them are in the very beginning part of their career, exploring what that means, and some people are um, have kind of fully formed this idea. And so Jennifer is also part of that exhibition. And as I mentioned earlier, she was also part of a series called Crafting Fashion, which happens every Saturday in the Object Stories Gallery from 1 to 5 p.m., where we're inviting local designers. Um, Jennifer's from, uh, from Oregon, so she does count as a local designer in my book. So <laughs> we're inviting local designers to come and share their, their experience and their craft with visitors. And so that we're sitting down and actually going through a physical hands-on process and teaching people a skill. Um, the, all of this is combined with our Italian style exhibition and the Italian style presenting sponsor is Nordstrom. Our lead sponsors are Joanne Lilly, Laura S. Meyer, and I also want to have a large thank you to our exhibition series presenter sponsors, the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Meyer Memorial Trust, the Collins Foundation, and Prudence M. Miller. And without any more of my talking, please give a warm welcome to Jennifer Jacobs. Switch back over to my presentation. There we go. Uh, thank you, Kristen, for that uh, really lovely introduction. And I want to thank the Portland Art Museum for having me. It's such a pleasure to be able to come back to Oregon. Um, since I'm from Corvallis originally, I love every chance that I can get to come and visit Portland and the state that I really love. Um, and it's also a pleasure as someone who works in a community of some designers and artists, but largely engineers and computer scientists to come engage with an audience who's really passionate about art and design um, because I feel a strong connection to those fields as you'll see through some of my uh, work that I'm presenting today. So um, the main topic of my lecture today is this idea of reconciling programming and making. And as the presentation is coming in the context of this fashion show that's a part of the museum, I want to clarify that although I have a strong personal interest in fashion and a lot of the output forms of the work that I do take the form of garments, fashion accessories, and clothing, I myself am much of a uh, 
a new entrant to the space of fashion and more comfortable with the space of computers and programming. And so I found that it's a really wonderful way to connect to the types of people and ideas that I'm interested in exploring, but um, not a, uh, an expert in the domain of fashion itself. So I'm a person who writes code, but I also enjoy working with my hands. I spend a lot of time drawing and I spend a lot of time making physical things. And up until about four years ago, these two fields were things that were very important in my life, but they were always separate. And that changed when I came to the MIT Media Lab. The MIT Media Lab is a research lab that's devoted to an interdisciplinary combination of a lot of different fields. So we have research groups in everything from neuroscience to music to bio-inspired design. And while I've been at the Media Lab, I've had the honor of working in two different research groups, the Hilo Tech Research Group and the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. And it's been these two groups whose values and approaches have informed the work that I'm going to be talking about today. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work that they do before I start on my own. Hilo Tech was a research group that was led by Leah Beakley. And the goal of Hilo Tech is to engage diverse audiences in designing and building their own technologies by situating the process of making technology in a new cultural material context. And that context is craft. So the materials of, of craft, the practices of working with your hands, and the types of people who are interested in the process of craft. And that's taken a lot of practical forms, um, things like e-textiles, which is the combination of sewing and electronics, so you can combine small reprogrammable computers, conductive thread, and then fabric um, and the process of sewing to create interactive uh, garments. Similarly, uh, we've worked in the space of integrating electronic circuit design with the art of paper craft, combining things like conductive paint and copper tape and regular paper materials with specialized components like adhesive conductive um, sticker uh, electronics that can be used to stick onto different elements of your drawing and create interactive uh, works of paper craft. And then we've also done work in taking advantage of a lot of the emerging electronics and fabrication technology to create functional electronic products that people can design, customize, and assemble themselves. Everything from uh, do-it-yourself radios to speakers to even a cell phone. So I spent two years in the Hilo Tech Research Group and then transitioned into the Lifelong Kindergarten Research Group, which is led by Mitch Resnick. And Lifelong Kindergarten shares a lot of the same spirit and values of Hilo Tech in that it's interested in broadening the types of people who can engage in making with technology. LOK is specifically interested in developing new technologies that take the spirit of the types of materials and approaches people use in kindergarten and expand the range of what people can design and create and learn with technology. So the project that our group is probably best known for is Scratch, which some of you might be familiar with, which is a programming language and also an online community that makes it easier for young people to create their own interactive stories, games, and animations, and share them with other people. But Lifelong Kindergarten also does a lot of work uh, in engaging with communities. So we've done multiple workshops across different groups of people, working with them and some of the technologies we developed to um, design and learn in a creative fashion. And the focus on this is in giving them an opportunity to create projects that not only teach them new skills and concepts, but more importantly, are personally relevant and meaningful to their everyday lives. So both LLK, Lifelong Kindergarten and Hilo Tech uh, provided the values and the direction behind the projects that I do today in my own work. So I came to the Media Lab also interested in broadening participation in the types in programming and the types of people who felt they could engage with active computer programming. And my approach in starting to do this was to think about how I used programming in my own life. And normally this was to create things that were interactive and lived on the screen. Um, but at the Media Lab, I began exploring programming as a tool for not just creating interactivity, but for drawing. So I began to write a series of programs, sorry, it's a little hard to see, that produced a series of drawings. Um, and then I was able to, using a separate piece of software, import one of these drawings into a um, 
computer-aided design tool, and then using a 3D printer, I was able to translate that design into a physical object. So in short, I was able to go from an algorithm to a necklace. And this process was difficult from my perspective, even as someone who's very familiar with writing computer code. There were a lot of challenges between getting the resultant design into some format that would actually be feasible for me to print. And then more importantly, once I had it printed, figuring out how I was going to turn that into something that I could actually wear. Um, so there were difficulties. But overshadowing the difficulties for me was the fact that this was a very compelling and rewarding process, that I had an opportunity to turn something that was created from a set of textual instructions into something I could wear seemed like a very powerful idea to me. And I began to consider how I could open this process to a wider group of people. Specifically, how I could broaden participation in using programming for making, or as I call it, procedural making. And this question is what motivates a series of projects and workshops that I've conducted over the past four years at the Media Lab. But before I talk about those projects, I'd like to elaborate a little bit more on this idea of why programming is a good tool for making in the first place. The process I described with making the necklace largely revolves around this field, which is called procedural design. Procedural design is essentially, very broadly, the idea of applying computer programming to the creation of visual forms and patterns. So designs created this way use procedural representations, which is basically just a way of saying a series of instructions or a series of steps or a description of a relationship, which are described using a programming language and then executed by a computer. And there's already a contingent of artists who have a background in programming who have been using procedural design as a tool for creating screen-based visual art. And procedural design is really powerful in this context because it lets artists do a lot of things that computers are really good at doing and are more difficult to do with, by hand or through manual methods. So programming offers an ability for artists to speed up repetitive tasks in creating a composition. If you want to create a copy of objects or a copy of a form in different places on your canvas, you can use a computer program to automate that. Programming is also a great tool to take advantage of the ability of inducing randomness into your composition. This is what's known as generative art. So you can create designs that are not entirely scripted or decided by the programmer, but are a mediation of decisions the programmer makes and random decisions that the computer makes. And this enables us to be surprised, often in a good way. And then, in addition, procedural design lets you define relationships between different parts of your composition. So you can do what's called creating constraints. You can basically specify a way that you want two objects to remain related despite any changes that you make to the rest of the composition. And this is an idea that I'll talk about a little bit later um, on in the talk as well. In a very broad context, um, procedural design lets an artist think of a composition or a work of art as a system rather than as a discrete object. And so by editing the input into that system, basically by changing their computer program, they can explore different design outcomes. And I'm just, this example that just played was me inputting in different data to the algorithm that generated the necklace and uh, returning a different set of results. So this is a really interesting thing to observe on the screen, but I would argue that it becomes much more compelling, at least to me personally, when the designs then take physical form. And this is something that's now become possible through digital fabrication. Digital fabrication describes a range of technologies from 3D printers to laser cutters to computer controlled milling machines to vinyl cutters and even your inkjet printer is technically a digital fabrication device. But it's essentially a machine that lets you input a toolpath and then will execute that toolpath either by cutting away from material or adding material to some physical form. So you can go from a digital design to a physical form. Digital fabrication machines are a great match for procedural design because they share a lot of the same affordances as computer programming. They're fast, they're extremely accurate, and they're able to execute complex uh, configurations and patterns that are difficult to do by hand. So they're a great match for the really complex and intricate forms that you often can produce when using procedural design techniques. 
But aside from that, digital fabrication is compelling to me because of the way it works with materials. So specifically, digital fabrication doesn't always result in a finished piece. Instead, what you get is a set of parts, which you have to assemble by hand. And often, you can use digital fabrication machines in conjunction with materials that people are already comfortable with working by hand. So laser cutters work really well with fabric. Uh, CNC milling uh, machines work really well with wood um, and also with uh, metals that can be shaped by hand. And 3D printed parts can be used as individual components in jewelry making. So in short, digital fabrication enables us not only to realize programmatically created designs in a physical form, but in materials that connect closely with the realm of craft and which therefore can engage groups of people who are interested in craft but might not have seen programming as relevant to this point. There are challenges to engaging in this form of making. Um, there are significant perceptual barriers that I've encountered. In general, when people think of programming, if they're not already acquainted with it, they often consider it irrelevant to creative pursuits or artistic interests. And also, it's often perceived, especially by young people, as prohibitively difficult to learn. There's also a convoluted workflow involved in this process. So although technically you can use any programming language to create a design, the process of actually getting that design to some finished form that's that's a bit that you can fabricate, let alone um, turn into a fully functional physical artifact, requires the knowledge of software platforms, of the use of the fabrication equipment, and also how to actually execute the craft task at hand. And then related to that, I would argue that there's a lack of accessible procedural design tools for people who are new to programming. Although there's been a lot of interest lately in engaging more and more people in programming in general and developing novice-oriented programming languages and tools, most of these tools are still aimed at producing screen-based or interactive um, uh, projects, which, although really compelling, don't really provide a good mechanism for design or for producing forms that can be created and uh, can be uh, combined with the process of making. So in thinking about these barriers, I began to think about approaches I could take in addressing some of them. And the first project I undertook in this space was called Codable Objects. And there were two primary goals in Codable Objects. The first was to simplify that workflow from creating a procedural design to making a completed physical object. And the second was to find a way to apply programming to forms of making which are relevant to people with an interest in art and design. So to create codable objects, I began by starting with an existing programming tool that a lot of artists and designers were already using. And this is this tool called Processing which is a piece of software to, that was developed by Casey Rees and Ben Fry, who are actually alumni of the Media Lab. And processing is essentially a programming interface, this textual programming environment, and also a, um, a programming library that makes it a little bit easier for people to write commands that then will draw things on their screen. And so I wrote an application on top of processing which let people write programs that would then be converted into a set of physical craft objects. And in this case, the two domains I chose were lamps and clothing and fashion accessories. So just to go in a little more detail about how people went about this, the idea is that you write a simple program in the processing environment that describes a set of points. And then when you do what's called compiling your code, or basically telling the computer to execute it, you're presented with a interface that shows your points and then a corresponding design which is mapped onto those points. And the design is constrained within the dimensions of a lamp. You can see a 3D preview of that lamp by switching to another uh, screen in the software. You can use a set of sliders in the tool to customize the design you created along with the dimensions of the lamp. And then once you're satisfied with the design, you can hit a button which enables you to export out a set of 2D tool paths, which when cut on a laser cutter will result in a set of parts that snap together to complete the finished lamp. And I used this software in a series of workshops where people created a wide variety of different lamps corresponding to their own personal design styles and aesthetics and tastes. And the lamps were relatively diversified and also, really excitingly, they were functional. So people use them in their homes and offices and are actually continuing to use them today. 
And then related to this, I created a more general application um, in the Codable Objects tool where people could design patterns for garments. And this was a little bit more of an involved workflow since it was more general. So people would start with a concept sketch and then translate uh, elements of that sketch into a set of cut patterns using a third-party design software like Adobe Illustrator. And then they would import in those cut patterns to the Codable Objects tool, where they could use the same coding approach to create a series of procedurally generated ornate patterns that would correspond to the cut pattern. They could customize this and see previews of it when they compiled their code, and then export out the individual designs into a series of tool paths, which could be used with the laser cutter. And then following this, there was a more involved stage of handcrafting that actually involved sewing to produce a finished garment. And I worked with a group of high school students to create uh, procedurally designed, digitally fabricated fashion garments as a part of Boston Fashion Week as a way of testing out this workflow. So in both of these workshops, there were a lot of uh, interesting things that I learned in this initial entry into engaging people and making in this way. The first thing I should point out is that um, I actually wasn't sure if people who are completely new to programming would be able to take advantage of a lot of the specific affordances of procedural design that I described originally um, in ways that applied to the types of things that they actually wanted to make. And it turned out that they could. Um, people created designs that were parameterized. People really enjoyed the use of, of randomness and generativity in a lot of their pieces. And people also, just in the process of making, commented on how the ability to do iterative designs with programming gave them a better ability to prototype um, something that was actually going to be taking physical form. Possibly more important than this, uh, however, was that people who had never programmed before emerged from these workshops not being experts in programming by any means, but by beginning to describe themselves in terms of being a programmer. So people started to self-identify as programmers, which was very exciting to me um, because people who previously had no interest in learning programming now had adopted it as something that could be a component of their identity going forward. And I think this is really powerful if we're trying to motivate people to stay engaged in these areas. There was also a general enthusiasm for the entire process. People really enjoyed this idea and this process of converting code into physical form, which was great for me because I, I personally enjoyed it and it was wonderful to see that enthusiasm reflected in other people. Um, and also people began interested, becoming interested in the other types of things that they could design and make in this process. And I should note that there was also kind of a magic present here, which, um, was interesting in that somehow people felt that the ability to create a garment or a lamp that had some type of source code behind it made it somehow special in a way. And I think this is in part related to some of the power that we associate in general with programming as being this um, force that uh, controls or apply is embedded in a lot of the things that we use every day but don't necessarily understand. Um, but I also think it's just because programming itself is a powerful way of thinking, um, and people were engaged in that. It wasn't all sunshine and roses, obviously. Um, there were a lot of things that were hard for people still. It was really difficult for novice programmers to learn and use textual programming environments, even processing, which was originally created for artists. And then aside from just the difficulty of learning the programming language and learning the syntax, um, Whenever you're using processing, as I mentioned, there's this process called compilation where you write your code and then you hit compile, and then you wait a few seconds and then you're shown the resultant design or image that's produced with that code. And although it's only a few seconds, that few seconds actually makes a really big difference when you're a designer, especially if you're new to programming, because designers, even amateur designers, make multiple changes to their design in a very short time, and they use the feedback from those changes to base their future decisions or design decisions on. So even a delay of a few seconds is a big problem. There is also a difficulty in moving back and forth between processing and some of the direct manipulation tools we were using, like Illustrator. Um, these tools are not necessarily designed to work together. They adopt very different interaction paradigms, and people struggled with having to go back and forth between them. 
So thinking about these challenges and also about the successes, I started another project, which is called Dress Code, and which was actually the software that I was using in the workshops I was um, conducting at the museum. And the idea of Dress Code was to develop a new programming tool which more closely coupled the act of writing code and the act of graphical design and drawing. And so dress code is a couple things. It's a programming interface and it's also a custom program syntax. But more importantly, it's a linked um, textual programming editor and a graphic drawing software. So hopefully this plays. So in dress code, you can create forms in multiple ways. You can type in code and then compile your program and see a design that will appear on the screen. But you can also um, de create designs by drawing them with the graphical drawing tool, similar to how you would in Illustrator or Photoshop. And then as you draw shapes, the completed designs show up on, or the completed, uh, the resultant code that actually describes those shapes will show up in the textual editor. So this is why it's a linked representation. Anything you do in one side of the software is reflected in the other side. And you can move back and forth between those two spaces. So doing things like creating loops and iteration in the programming environment, and then manipulating the position of those objects by selecting them and dragging them with the mouse. Um, so the idea is to be able to move back and forth as you design and choose what tools are appropriate in different situations. I also wanted to uh, use dress code for the creation of physical things in the same way that I've been using codable objects. So I embedded in it a series of parametric templates or basically pre-created designs that could have some flexibility in the um, ornamentation of the patterns that were produced within them. And then everything that you create in dress code can be exported out into a file format that once again is compatible with digital fabrication machines. Similar to the codable objects process, I evaluated dress code through a series of workshops with different age groups in different locations, ranging from museums to schools to maker spaces. And the content of the workshop would always vary depending on what type of fabrication technology was available and what the group of people was. But we've explored different spaces, often wearable spaces, from creating um, laser cut leather jewelry to hand sewn tote bags to procedurally designed temporary tattoos and screen printing onto t shirts. Many of the same uh, elements of enthusiasm and interest in engaging with programming in this way were present in the dress code workshops as well. But because we were using a linked representation, a linked editor between a programming tool and a graphic drawing environment, there was also some new things that emerged. And one of those things was that in a lot of the designs, there was a closer coupling of designs that were drawn manually or by hand and designs that were produced procedurally or through the use of computer code. And this conjunction was really exciting because it demonstrated not only that novices could take advantage of a lot of the applications of procedural design, but that they could also simultaneously embed their own personal style and specifically evidence of their own hand in the designs that they were created. So corresponding uh, complex and repeated forms with imperfect irregular forms produce some really striking results. I also noticed that people were intuitively able to use the drawing tools in the graphic interface and were very drawn to these tools. And in some cases, people talked about how they felt that this helped scaffold the process of learning the programming side of the tool, where they would draw shapes and use it as a probing mechanism to produce, uh, to, to sort of interrogate the different types of programming statements that could be, drawn, that could be generated by drawing shapes. Um, and this was interesting, but I also noticed simultaneously that people relied in general much more on the graphic aspects of the tool rather than the textual aspects, and that some of the same barriers of learning the programming syntax emerged as in the earlier workshops with codable objects. And so this observation led me to return to thinking about the relationship be between programming and visual art and creation more generally. So I really like this Monroe Beardsley quote, the form of an aesthetic object is the total web of relations among its parts. So whether intuitively or explicitly, I think that artists think in terms of visual relationships. 
Um, and artists and graphic designers produce complex compositions and finished works of art because they're able to skillfully manipulate these relationships between different forms in a composition, whether it's the act of combining different forms or transforming um, basic forms so that they become more complex. Basically, artists work by manipulating objects based on their properties, properties of color, texture, position, scale, shape, and more ambiguous properties um, that apply to the aesthetics of the objects they're, they're manipulating. And this feels a lot to me to be similar to the way programmers think. So although programmers aren't always creating visual art, in programming, simple procedures and properties are organized into representations called objects. And if you're a programmer, I'm specifically talking about object-oriented programming right now, but for the sake of, of the lecture, I'll just use the word programming in general. But programming is powerful in part because it lets people do this thing called abstraction. So while they're creating these individual simple objects and manipulating them, they can rely on the computer to maintain the relationships that they define between these simple objects and then build on top of those simple relationships more complex ones and create more complex objects. And so this is what let, what's lets an individual create something as sophisticated as a piece of software. The difference um, between, although, although there are parallels between the way programmers think and the way artists think, artists, much more so than programmers, are fundamentally concerned with thinking about and manipulating visual relationships as opposed to general relationships. And this is where I think a lot of programming tools, even the ones I'm devel I've developed, present this significant barrier to visual thinkers. Even when they're not applied, even when programming languages are applied to making art, they still enforce a separation between the symbolic representation or the way you're generating that art, in this case the program, and then the resulting object that's produced through that representation, and this would be the artwork. Um, and even if you look at visual programming tools or tools that are created often for architects or designers, they still enforce this separation. So whether it's a block-based programming language where you snap together blocks or a data flow programming language where you chain together different modules, even if you're using a visual interaction paradigm to manipulate that programming, it's still separate from the resultant artwork and you're moving back and forth between these two spaces. But if you look at art forms like painting and drawing, the canvas that the artist works on is both the medium through which the artist creates, or to use a software term, the interface, and the finished work of art, or the place where that work of art emerges from. And this is one of the reasons why digital drawing tools like Illustrator or Photoshop, which reference the direct manipulation interaction that artists rely on in the physical world, are often much easier for artists to adopt when compared to programming languages. However, most of these tools lack accessible um, ability, the accessible ability to actually let people do procedural design as opposed to just digital design, so to use something like a programming language. So I begin to wonder if it would be possible to make digital drawing tools that took advantage of the importance of visual interactions for artists, and so used direct manipulation interactions to let artists program. And Para is a tool which is basically a programming model that rather than expressed through text, is expressed and represented through the process of illustration. And in the spirit of the Media Lab, which loves giving live demos, I'm gonna try and give a live demo of Para right now. Um, so this is Para, and I should mention that it's developed in collaboration with members of the Creative Technology Lab at Adobe Research. Uh, and at first glance, it looks a lot like a digital um, drawing tool like Illustrator. So you can draw regular shapes or irregular forms. But what makes it different is the way in which you can manipulate these shapes in a way that's similar to programming. So I can select a shape and apply what's called a behavior to it. And there's a number of preset behaviors. I'll apply a linear distribution. And what I have now, um, is essentially a distribution of shapes that's very similar to a distribution that would be produced through an iteration or a loop in code. So I have a set of shapes that's copied and repeated along this line, and I can control the position of the line or the endpoints by moving the start and end shapes. I can increase the number of shapes in the distribution using the mouse wheel. And then also, because I'm treating this like a programming language, 
If I go in and edit any individual shape, they'll all change to correspond with that. And so this is sort of the idea of the way objects work in programming, where each of these shapes on the screen is not a uh, static individual copy. It's basically a object that is representing some master definition somewhere else. And when you update an individual shape, it's updating that master definition and then propagating those changes to all of the shapes that are looking at that master shape. Uh, and you don't just have to do things like lines. For example, you can create um, a radial distribution where the start and end points control the start, the radius of the circle. Um, or you can scaffold your own distributions along a path that you draw. So if I draw a path with the software, and I'll just remove the fill. There we go. And then if I drag another path on top of that, it will repeat on a distribution that's defined by that path. So I can control the start and end points by moving the start and end shapes. I can increase the copy number as before. And I can also go in and update that actual path, and the shapes will continue to be constrained among it. And so um, it enables you to start to create these complex uh, uh, procedurally created forms that you can edit completely through direct manipulation. Now, I've been talking a lot throughout this about the idea of programming as being this great tool to create and manipulate complexity. And we're trying to maintain that in the design of Para. So you can not only create these individual distributions, but you can layer them on top of one another for more complex effects. So I'm going to zoom out and then select this object. And on top of this path distribution, I'm going to apply a radial distribution. So now I've got a two-layer distribution, which I can move in one layer and manipulate that radial position, and then move in another layer. Oops and manipulate that fall along path distribution and change the individual shapes. And as I kind of mentioned, very important in this is this idea of consistent feedback. So you can see immediately how changes to one part of your design are propagated out throughout the entire form and get an immediate reflection on how that's going to affect your overall composition. And just to sort of prove a, a point, I will zoom out again. Uh, maybe zoom in a little bit, there we go, and apply on top of this distribution a linear distribution and just show once again how those changes are then, sorry, it's a little hard to select, propagated again throughout the entire form as I move in and adjust the shapes. Um, okay, going back to my presentation. So, um, Para is still in its early stages. We're currently iterating on it to develop a more open-ended version that lets people do a lot of different types of actions. And we're also in the step of thinking about how we can apply this not just to digital illustration, but starting to look again at applying this to the creation of forms that are viable for making. So moving into a three-dimensional version of Para and applying it to things like 3D printing um, and other forms of digital fabrication. So um, I'd like to touch on one final point in this presentation about the larger context in which this work is being conducted and some of my efforts to reflect on the cultural meaning of combining technology and making. Right now, especially being at MIT, there's a tendency to get wrapped up in the excitement of novel digital design tools and the ways in which they can extend our ability to make different types of things. And in particular, there's a lot of enthusiasm right now for combining technology and making in a broader way in our culture, which is often fits within this idea of the maker movement, um, where people are getting access to digital fabrication technology, but also to electronics prototyping platforms, and the idea that the process of making with technology itself is becoming more democratic. But if we think more broadly, then we have to recognize that people have been making things for a long time. And for most of human history, they've been making them without the use of digital tools um, or computers. But our conceptions of making, especially often at MIT, are framed mostly within an industrial context and a digital context. 
And so I became really interested in questioning how non-digital cultures, and specifically cultures that are in great, engaged directly in traditional forms of craft, could maybe offer an informed position on the direction that our digital design and making tools are taking us and give us insight into some of the things that they are enabling us to do, but also the things that we might be losing in this transition. So in order to sort of pursue this question, uh, myself and another researcher at the Media Lab, Amit Soran, visited a community of African makers that preserve a very ancient form of jewelry craft. And this was the San com uh, community in Namibia. And when we visited them, we brought with us an initial knowledge of the types of things that they were making, and also a set of digital design and fabrication tools that we used in our, as, a, as a part of our own making practice at the Media Lab. So what this meant is that we brought, I brought dress code and a number of other types of procedural design software, and we also brought a small digital fabrication machine, a computer-controlled milling device. And then we also brought a set of pre-made 3D printed jewelry components that we had designed prior to the visit. And while we were there, we engaged in a collaborative workshop. So we worked with the African um, Namibian, Namibian craftspeople to merge our digital tools and our digital expertise with their expertise, materials, and practice of um, making handcrafted jewelry. Specifically, the space that they work in is using ostrich eggshells to make beads for intricate jewelry patterns. So what emerged through the collaboration were a set of collaboratively created artifacts that blended digital fabrication approaches, procedural designed um, forms, and also the crafts and aesthetics of the sand craftspeople that we worked with. Through this process, we learned a lot. There were some positives. There's some cases where our digital tools were not only something that had success in the collaboration, but seemed to be also relevant in this very non-digital context. So the ability of digital tools to be immediate to enable us to take designs from one context and reappropriate them to a new context and new material with extreme accuracy um, was relevant even in this non-digital society and even with groups of people who are entirely new to the affordances of these tools. And there were some very compelling pieces that emerged collaboratively through this process. But there were also limitations that we identified. Um, one of the primary ones was that we recognized that in non-digital cultures, the abstractions of digital tools conflict directly with the concrete design practices of people who are accustomed to working with materials on hand and working with their hands. And so this was something that we saw as a barrier and not something that was easily overcome. And then more broadly, we saw that the design of our technology itself, both the software we were creating, the computer, and also the fabrication machines were all things that were designed to be operated by one person at a time. And when we were working on these machines, we found it very difficult to engage in this broader making process that was happening around us. So we reflected on the fact that the digital tools themselves in their design conflicted with the intensely social aspect of making in the San community. By making things with the San, we were able to gain a better understanding of how they use making as a means not only to create artifacts, but as a way to build and strengthen community ties. And furthermore, how making is something that is deeply embedded in their own daily lives. And returning from Africa, I had an opportunity to once again reflect on my work in combining making and technology in our own culture. And I think that for me right now, the broader takeaway is that whether we're enabling it via digital tools or we're practicing it by hand, when at its best, making is not just this tool for creating objects, but it's a way of reinforcing the individual and reinforcing the community. And going forward, I really hope to continue developing tools and experiences that emphasize not just how technology can extend our ability to make new and interesting objects, but how it can help us express ourselves in ways that are pleasurable and personally reaffirming, and how it can provide another channel for connecting with the people around us. Thank you. So I'm happy to take questions. And also, if you're curious about any of the work I showed, my website is listed along with LL Lifelong Kindergarten and Hilotech's websites.
Um, yes, you in the front row. Uh, I think they're coming with the mic, so maybe just wait till they get to Affordances. Um, it's a design term. It often ref it refers to the way a physical object enables you to do certain things with it. So the affordance of this object is that I can hold it with my hand, I can open it, I can drink from it. Um, it's relatively heavy, so I could throw it if I wanted to. I could put something else in it. Um, and so we often talk about affordances in terms of physical things, like fabric affords the ability to cut it, to stretch it. Wood affords the ability to make solid objects that can support other objects. Oops. <laughs> um, but then we also can think about it in terms of digital affordances. So what types of things do com does computer programming afford? What types of things does a 3D printer afford that are different from other technologies? Um, probably because I hang out a lot with architects and designers. <laughs> but thanks for the clarification. Uh, yes? Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, have you experimented with uh, taking objects that exist in the real world and then analyzing their elements or their components and then modifying them through code? That's a great question. Um, so actually, I have a, another researcher I'm collaborating with, and right now we're working on developing a project around that problem. Um, and there are also other researchers who work in that space, which is often called inverse procedural design, so going the other way around. Um, and there's some really exciting and interesting work that's, that's done in that area. The challenge of that often is that, although it's already a hard problem, to take some arbitrary form and infer a set of rules from that form. Um, e even if you can solve that problem, you still really haven't addressed the whole issue from a designer's perspective. Because actually, um, the way a computer represents relationships in, to itself and the way designers and humans perceive relationships are often at odds with one another. And so, Although it might be meaningful to the computer, and this is often the case if you've ever used something like um, the auto recommender on Amazon, although it might be meaningful to the computer that you both like cookbooks and you like power tools, um, or that's not a great example, but <laughs> uh, often the way it displays the why of why that's related is based on probabilities and wouldn't really convey any additional useful information to a designer. Um, in addition, there are so many actions that designers take to create relationships and forms. And so it's often uh, difficult for a designer themselves to even, unless they are engaging the process of explicitly describing those steps, to realize all of the inferences they're making, because we're very good at seeing patterns and seeing relationships automatically. Um, so it's often hard to know what are the right relationships to display to a designer when you're kind of inferring relationships from an existing pattern. Um, so, but it is an important problem and it is one that we're looking into. Uh, yeah, in the front row. Um, are these programs that you've created open source or free for use? Everything that I've created is open source. So on my website, there's links to either download um, most of the software or, uh, and there's also tutorials for some of them. And then um, the software that I demonstrated, Para, is actually a JavaScript-based application. And the demo that I demonstrated is live and online, so you can try it out in a web browser. Um, but uh, yeah, I, since I'm a researcher, the easiest way to get tools in the hands of people are, is at least not to, to charge for them. And I have that luxury, personally. But, uh, in the back. Um, so it depends on what information you're collecting when someone is drawing freehand. So if you drew with a stylus in the system, then that would be rec represented as a vector path, although the current version we're working with um, doesn't actually recognize like a stylus interaction, but it's something that we're interested in exploring and it's not, there's no like direct um, challenge to that. But once again, like the the process of drawing by hand 
is actually a lot more complex than the process of specifying set of points and curves. So the speed, the pressure, the um, uh, all play a, a role in uh, producing a kind of stroke that the artist is interested in producing. And right now, we're still trying to figure out how do we bring in bring to bear those properties into a system like this. Well. It's one of the, I'm actually returning to do work with Adobe this summer, and one of the possibilities is to focus specifically on parameterized strokes as opposed to, um, or sorry, procedurally defined strokes as opposed to a larger system for drawing. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right there. I'm familiar with uh, Media Lab Prado, um, although I don't, to my knowledge, none of the people I work with directly work with them. Um, I, I guess I feel like your question is kind of a, a complex one. There's a lot of um, potential positives and negatives for engaging with communities through these technologies. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if you were aware of them and what you thought of them. Um, I am aware of them. I'm not entirely up to date on their current work, um, but uh, but it sounds like something I should check into again. Um, if you have specific things to recommend to me, I'd love to hear them. The environmental egg pro project that they did was a project where they made had these sculptures that people were making that were sort of like the bean in Chicago. Hmm. And, um, but they were small, and they were using them to do environmental monitoring in Madrid and Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they made thousands of these things, which I guess, like bureaucratic air quality monitoring mm -hmm. is sort of a crude instrument. Mm -hmm. And the kids and families built the eggs, they built the hardware, they pro did all the programming, and they made thousands of these things that send information <coughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, like citizen science stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we have um, a group at the lab called the Center for Civic Media, and they're doing a lot of research around finding ways to engage people civically through designing and building technology. So they have projects where people can create, modify a weather balloon to create a system for mapping their own area and uploading the maps to a digital platform. Um, related work, so they, they definitely do a lot of work in that space, it seems relevant. Um, uh, yes? Is this process related to the process of manufacturing artificial limbs for uh, So there is a group at the Media Lab called Biomechatronics that works specifically on prosthesis design. A lot of the same uh, approaches to procedural design are applied there in procedural <laughs> modeling. Although often they engage in a, and so they use a lot of digital fabrication in their work. They use a lot of um, computer programming to model the, both the limb that they're developing a prosthesis for and the prosthesis itself. Um, and, par and the ability to create constraints between different elements is very important. One of the things that they do that um, I don't spend a lot of time doing is this, this uh, approach called optimization or form finding, where they basically have a set of data points um, that are related to the person's body, related to the physical requirements of the limb they're developing, and then they have an algorithm that basically finds the optimal form which satisfies all of those data points or those requirements. So it's a little different focus, but the same t uh, techniques and approaches are used in general. I'm just applying it to make beautiful things, not, not limbs. <laughs> um, but uh, right there in the back with the hat. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I, I understand your question. Um, so especially if you're, often this is most manifested in when you're adding some type of randomness or generativity to a design, and a lot of the decisions are things that are surprising that happen and weren't explicitly articulated by the artist, but I think it's true for um, a lot of types of procedural design where you might start with one concept and then be surprised in a bunch of different ways and over the course of working through iterating on your program, you'll produce a totally different end result. And often um, this is actually very similar to I think the process that a lot of artists engage with in traditional media. The space where maybe it becomes a little more um, ambiguous working with programming environments is you often can more directly pull information from other sources. So whether that's copying, digitally copying a design that someone else has created and using it in your pattern directly, or copying someone's source code and putting it into your design and incorporating it into your program um, begins to become a little more ambiguous about who the original creator of the work is. Uh, and so it's something that I think um, in the space that I'm working in, because I'm working with a group of people who are very open to sharing the types of things they're producing and don't have, are more interested in producing finished physical artifacts rather than having strong senses of personal style and ownership exclusively over the work they're creating, there's a flexibility and a freedom we get to, to, to share code, to explore different design iterations and um, focus on producing a finished artifact rather than defining a personal style. Uh, I think as I continue to work with artists, that question becomes more um, contentious, uh, but also applies in general to working with any type of digital media. So it's something that I think as a culture we're learning to, to grapple with. Um, but it's a great question. Uh, I'm only just starting to explore some of, some of those issues. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I just want to make sure anyone who hasn't asked a question yet is, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, how does your dress code and era fit in with uh, MLD, Make on Demand? Um, I'm not entirely familiar with that, uh, that term. Is that like uh, on-demand fabrication services, like Shapeways or? Yeah. OK, so um, if you guys aren't familiar with that, basically there are companies online where you can upload a design and then they have access to 3D printers or laser cutters and will um, fabricate your files for you and then ship them to you. So even if you don't have access to a makerspace or a 3D printer yourself, you can still kind of order customized um, physical objects based on designs that you create. And uh, in general, um, the designs that are exported from my software are compatible with the file formats that services like th that these companies require. Um, an interesting area of research that I haven't ventured into much is sort of how you streamline that process of helping people to use these services, not just to produce artifacts, but also in the ecosystem of a specific craft area or a specific project area. So if you don't have any familiarity with working with digital tools or with um, you know, any knowledge of what digital fabrication can be applied to, just having these companies exist doesn't really uh, do you much good. So I think there needs to be support for sort of um, giving people a better pathway into actually in designing things that can be used with these services um, while still giving them flexibility in the types of things that they design. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. with the programming and uh, artistic creation part, but is your group doing any uh, work reaching out, like enabling people to have access to these machines that can actually create a physical object from these designs? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a really important point to bring up because I think often um, we get ahead of ourselves a little bit with this enthusiasm around 3D printers and maker culture and this idea that soon, very soon, everyone will have a 3D printer in their home, no problem, and we will use it to make everything. And um, there's a couple of you know, questions there. The first is like, 
3D printers are very expensive, and so even as they become more available and they're dropping in price, there's still a large group of people who, you know, they're just out of reach for, just like having a personal computer is out of reach for a large group of people, and I think that goes overlooked a lot. Um, also, I think it's still really an open question, specifically with 3D printers, about how, uh, how applicable or how, how the technology is actually relevant to a broad set of people. So I think that they can be relevant in situations where people are making things, but honestly, like, if I was gonna have a piece of fabrication equipment in my home, it would be a laser cutter, not a 3D printer. Um, uh, but more so, like, I think that we're actually unrealistic a little bit about how the technology is advancing to provide us with this replicator-like future. Like, 3D printers are really good at making bits of plastic and metal. They're going to eventually potentially be great at making other things, but we're going to be in this plastic and metal phase for a long time. Um, uh, so, so I'm sort of of two minds to, to go back to your original question. Um, on one hand, I think it's very important to continue to build different design tools for emerging technologies so that as these technologies become more widely, widely adopted, the people who are making the 3D printers will be aware of the fact that maybe we should be thinking about designing these for people who aren't engineering students or who aren't people who want to print out little plastic puzzles. You know, maybe we should think about what it means if someone is a ceramicist and they might be using a 3D printer and, and developing tools that get different people engaged in that I think is one avenue to um, encourage the development of, of digital fabrication technology. Um, but on the other hand, personally in my work, I've tried also to develop approaches that don't require you to have access just to these types of tools. So a lot of the work I do is with a vinyl cutter, which you can get a craft vinyl cutter for about $160, still not you know, the cheapest thing, but more accessible. Um, I've done a lot of work with just regular inkjet printing. You can hack an inkjet printer and print onto fabric. And although it's often less glamorous than a 3D printer, um, people have access to them and are more readily able to use them more immediately. So, uh, yes. What do you think the advantages are of making things this way over traditional practices like the people you visited mm -hmm. in Africa and their way of making things. And how, what, where's the impact societally there if, every, if, if we really move away from making things by hand? I mean, for someone like me who has some experience making things by hand but has not trained for years as a carver or a sculptor, 3D printing and laser cutting and CNC milling let me fabricate things that I would not be able to do by hand very easily. I'd have to practice a lot. So there are ways of um, it, ways of, of getting closer to producing physical things and materials that you have less experience with. Uh, granted, though, like a uh, laser cutter or CNC mill is never going to make anything as beautiful or as um, refined as something that is carved by an expert wood carver or something like that. So you lose individuality, you lose the element of um, process and risk and individual style in doing so. Um, the, so there are also things that it is technically possible to create specifically with 3D printer that arguably you can't create with any other way of making because it's an, the way the technology works. It's an additive fabrication technology. So you can, for example, print pieces that are interconnected. And this is really powerful for a lot of engineers and some designers who rely on this new form of technology. But um, because it's only just becoming available, that's a pretty small group of people and uh, often is less relevant in the work that I'm doing. Um, on the other hand, like there are lots of things that it's still much easier to do with traditional methods. And I think I'm really interested in finding places for those areas to converge, because then you have the widest range of opportunities for making. Um, yeah, I think there was a hand right there. Um, do you have a question or no? No? OK. Um, all right, well, thank you for your questions. <laughs> <laughs>